Thank you all for being here, uh, especially Congressman Blumenauer. He's uh, been my representative for 18 years in Oregon. I can remember doing bike uh, campaign campaigns with him for many years now. Um, and he's really been a stalwart for our industry. So I unfortunately also have a fairly drab topic in cannabis to discuss with you, and that's really the pharmaceutical takeover of the cannabis industry. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this stuff you guys know, and uh, I will try and be as, as quick as I can with it. So the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act of the 1970s, was put in place to basically give guidance to healthcare professionals and law enforcement on the uses uh, and the potential problems of uh, controlled substances and drugs. And uh, recently we've heard about Republicans pushing bills in Congress to reschedule cannabis. On the surface, uh, this seems like a win for us as an industry. Um, obviously, the fact that uh, cannabis is Schedule 1 to begin with is absurd. Um, but any movement towards getting it away from Schedule 1 is, is good, except for what it, what it will mean for the industry as a whole. Um, about, uh, oh, so, so Schedule. So Schedule 1 means the, the product has no medical benefit and has an extremely high potential for abuse. Uh, cannabis shares that list with heroin, methamphetamines, LSD, um, and to, to think that the cannabis is on the same plane as something like heroin really is just absurd. To give you some perspective, uh, Schedule 4, drugs that we've deemed uh, in healthcare to be uh, safe and, and therapeutic, drugs like Xanax, Clonopin, Valium, Soma, Ativan, Ambien, I'm sure everybody in this room knows somebody who either abuses those pills or is addicted to those pills. And cannabis is the way out. As a healthcare professional, I'm an ER ICU nurse by trade. Um, I've administered all of these drugs. I've been part of the problem um, recommending these these pharmaceutical treatments to many patients because that's what we're told to do. And unfortunately, uh, we've created the opiate epidemic that this is driving this country um, to ruin right now. So many of the problems that we're seeing in crime and economy have to do uh, mostly with opiate addictions and what those do to people in terms of crime. The fact that cannabis is on a list with the likes of heroin and the drugs that we know people abuse every day, like Xanax and Valium, um, are, are legal and cannabis is not, is, is, is just an absurd proposition. So now that we understand a little bit about the, the schedules and, and where they come from, uh, let's talk about how pharmaceutical industry is, is working to take over this industry as we speak. Um, about the same time I moved to Oregon in 1998, I've been a medical grower here since 99, um, the, a small company was being formed called GW Pharmaceutical. And I'm sure some of you have heard of GW Pharmaceutical and some may have not. Um, it's actually quite interesting to me that even in healthcare, um, people haven't heard of GW Pharmaceutical and what they've been doing. But when I came to Oregon, GW Pharmaceutical formed in 1998, and it was biotech entrepreneurs from the UK and the US who came together and formed GW Pharmaceutical, and they had many connections in the political spheres of both countries. And quickly after uh, bringing their business to life, they were granted unlimited access to the only federally funded, managed, cannabis farm in the United States on the campus of Old Miss. I know it's an absurd proposition that the federal government has its own cannabis farm while telling the rest of us it's illegal. Along with this, GW was basically granted unlimited 
access to the cannabis medicine that was being produced. I say medicine loosely because I'm not sure the government's doing a very good job of it. Uh, and they've been researching and developing product lines the entire time that the government's been telling us it's illegal. Uh, Sativex, which I believe was mentioned once or twice earlier, is the first drug available by GW Pharmaceutical, and it's available in 29 countries around the world right now. Their second drug that they are bringing to market is called Epidiolex. It's in stage three clinical trials here in the United States right now, and likely will be submitted for approval uh, this quarter. If that happens, likely you will see an approval for the first plant-derived cannabis therapy in the United States. That will create two problems for us. The first one is the first thing that drives pharmaceutical sales is that they have somebody who can pay for it. Well, once this is an FDA approved therapy, health insurance and other third party providers can now start paying for this drug. The second part is on one hand, you'll have the federal government uh, telling us this is a Schedule One drug and has no medical benefit. On the other hand, you'll have had a, a drug that's just been approved by the FDA for use in the United States. When that happens, the federal government is going to have to do something about it. The next stage for the pharmaceutical companies is, as we've already seen through these Republican bills being pushed in Congress, the pharmaceutical lobby will push hard for the rescheduling of cannabis. If cannabis is rescheduled to a Schedule II or a Schedule III or a Schedule IV, which is all better than Schedule I, the problem with that is all products that come to market will now have to be FDA trialed. I'm not sure if any of you understand the complexity and the expense of taking a product through FDA trials, especially one where your test subjects are basically humans but it is an extremely complex process and extremely costly and would absolutely be a disaster for small business in this industry. So now that we understand what's happening on the federal level, let's look closer at state levels. So Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania have all recently passed medical cannabis legislation. They're all in the process of implementing those policies or those programs. Um, I myself was looking at expanding to Pennsylvania. There is some really attractive things from a business standpoint going on in Pennsylvania, and there's some things that are extremely difficult. So in Pennsylvania, the first thing they did was hire a former, ph former pharmaceutical executive to implement their medical cannabis program. The second thing they did was they're only offering 25 grower processor permits in the entire state. To be able to apply for one of those permits, you have to have two and a half million dollars in the bank. You have to have a contract with a healthcare research institution or pharmaceutical research company. And you can only bring consumer ready medical products to market. Inhalers, vaporizers, pills, tinctures, salves. That is an astronomical challenge for most of the small businesses in this industry. There are but a handful to maybe a dozen who can actually meet those challenges right now. So you see that the state is preparing the industry for a pharmaceutical takeover by the things that they're implementing. Along with that then, a former pharmaceutical executive gets to review the business plans and proprietary information for probably the 100 best cannabis industry businesses as they apply for licenses in Pennsylvania. This will all set us up for failure and takeover by the pharmaceutical industry. MedMen, Medicine Man, those are the people applying for licenses on that scale. The rest of us will continue to have to work hard to push this industry forward, and the only way that we can be successful is a complete descheduling. We cannot, yes! We cannot have a rescheduling of this drug. It makes no sense. 
This product should be guided just like alcohol and tobacco, delisted completely. And I ask all of you guys to share this information, to support descheduling efforts. When you see these Republican bills that come up and they're being pushed forward on social media as some kind of great win for, for cannabis, be critical. Be thinking about what that means. Follow the money, because that's where the money is going. Thank you very much.